Hi, I'm Hilary Victoria and welcome back to my crime and policing channel. In today's session, we're looking at more British bad guys and the biggest British bad guys in particular and girls, the bad guys and girls all across the world. But in Britain, we've got some truly seriously bad eggs. One in particular, yet another cool name, but a seriously bad person is none other than Dr. Death himself. Now you might be thinking Dr. Death sounds like, I don't know, a, a guy from a death metal band. Actually, Dr. Death is the moniker given to Dr. Harold Shipman. Now, Dr. Harold Shipman killed over 250 people during his reign of terror from 1975 all the way up to 1998 when he was finally identified for the crimes that he had committed. So, I use the title Doctor. You might be thinking, is this guy actually a real doctor? And the answer is yes. Well, he was before he got struck off for, you know, murdering people. Dr. Harold Shipman was indeed a doctor, quite a well-revered doctor for a long, long time until it was discovered he had got some dark intentions and had done some pretty, pretty nasty stuff, namely killing over 250 people. So what could lead somebody, a pillar of the community, to commit such disgusting acts against people around him. And the worst thing was, the people that Shipman targeted were super vulnerable, right? When we look at types of serial killers and what drives people to do stuff in forensic psychology, you look at things like power and control, lust and thrill seekers, your hedonistic style murderers. This person, we're looking at the power and control aspect of serial killers. Let's start off way, 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 way back when Harold Shipman was a very small boy. Shipman was born into a working class family in Nottingham, up north, kind of near where I am, actually. I'm not going to tell you where I am because that'd be weird. Anyway, yeah, so Shipman was born in Nottingham, one of four kids to Vera and Harold. Um, Harold was a truck driver. Vera was his mom. Not entirely sure what she did for a job, even if she had a job. It was a long time ago, remember. He was born in 1946. And at that time, it wasn't um, super common for like wives to have jobs and stuff. It would be like the typical housewife, husband goes off to work scenario, woman raises the kids. So he was gifted by, you know, no stretch of the imagination, is very switched on, smart kid. He even got like scholarships to go to really good schools so he could learn to eventually become like he did a doctor. It was at 17 years old, however, his little world got turned upside down. And he was very, very close to his mum. All the way, like, you know, through growing up and stuff. But at 17 years old, um, she died from cancer. What he witnessed, however, during the end of life care for his mother, seemed to have had a, such a massive impression on him that it formed the MO, so his modus operandi, for his killing career. It was when his mother was being treated for cancer for the end of life care, when the doctors were administering morphine to his mum, he saw her pain being eased and that link between life and death and the power over it. This doctor was like a god amongst men, right? And that's what Shipman began to believe about himself. Definitely a narcissist, right? And in fact, that's been said by people too, who, who knew him that you know, he had this superiority kind of vision of himself over other people, always thought he was cleverer, always thought he was the most important person in the room. Okay, so this is what he was kind of like as a person, but he was well respected in the community until, you know, he killed everybody. But something else happened. So yes, he became a doctor, he was very successful, started getting like a really good reputation, but in 1976, he was busted for something else. He'd been falsifying prescriptions for drugs and he'd been taking them. He developed this addiction to opioids. So opioids, you're looking at things, morphine, thiamorphine. Heroin is the big opiate that street users use. So he got addicted to opiates. He admitted it. He was like, yeah, I'm addicted to this stuff. I cannot get enough of this stuff. So they told him he had to go to rehab. He had his license kind of like paused to practice. And he had to go to rehab and get off, get clean, get off the drugs. Okay. However, the following year, he regained his position as a GP. That's a quick turnaround, right? For like a serious drug addiction. So much so that you're going against professional practice. You've got these rules that you do not abuse. You know, you, you don't abuse that position of trust and write yourself prescriptions to get high. Just don't do it, guys. He did. 
But like I said, within a year, he turned it all around, managed to convince everyone that he was a, a really good fella. He got back into the GP practice and he stayed there in a place called Donnybrook for 15 years. After that, he started his very own practice because this guy was a well-renowned good doctor. Or was he? Well, it was in 1975 that Dr. Harold Shipman claimed his first victim. And that was 71-year-old Eva Lyons, or Leons. I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong. So Eva was 71 when Dr. Shipman administered some painkillers to her. She was she had cancer, she was being treated for that, and he gave her a lethal injection, enough so to end her life. So what he did was he gave her some painkillers and then he went to see her husband and asked for a cup of tea. He calmly waited for her to die, which she did. The family didn't think anything of it at the time. And obviously later, years later on, when everything came to light, they were horrified after what they had discovered. So his first kill was in 1975 that we know about. And it was exactly that type of person, victim, that Shipman would target the most. So the most vulnerable people in our society and generally elderly female patients who were receiving care for, for a myriad of illnesses. What investigators believed, though, is that maybe... He saw his mother in those people and that he was trying to be the person to relieve them of their pain, to free them in some kind of psychological way. Was he really trying to free his own mother? Had he become confused within this, this state that people were in and him as a doctor, the, the life giver, the life taker? He definitely thought he was the God amongst men. We know that. But... What was his intentions with this demographic of victims that he was targeting? So what he would generally do was give people morphine and he would quietly watch them while they passed away. Or he'd give them morphine and then leave, knowing that they would die very quickly afterwards. Now then, eventually, things started raising suspicions and the local undertakers were like, this doctor's got a lot of people coming through our doors. So much so, in fact, it's like way more than anybody else in the area. This is a bit weird. And they report him to the authorities thinking something's just, it's just not right. However, Shipman being Shipman, being charming and influential, convinced people that everything was totally cool and that it was everything he was doing was totally above board. And the fact that he was falsifying medical records had not yet been picked up. The police also failed to do any comprehensive background checks at this time. You kind of just let him get away with it because he's a doctor, the good doctor, of course. As with most killers and criminals, Shipman started to get a little bit complacent. And this is what happens. People get a little bit sloppy and that's when they start making mistakes, which then reveals them to the world and to, you know, the authorities. And it wasn't actually long after this initial investigation when Shipman was caught. And that's because he got greedy. Now, the final victim that we know of of Harold Shipman's was Kathleen Grundy. Kathleen Grundy was 81 years old. And like the other victims of Shipman, she received a lethal dose of morphine. Now then, what raised the suspicions here is that Kathleen Grundy's will had just been changed. I bet you can't guess what had happened to that will. I, I, bet you, I bet you actually can, yeah. So what had happened is, for some miraculous reason, Kathleen Grundy's will, she'd left everything to Dr. Harold Shipman. How uncanny is that? And also in this will, she expressed specific instructions that she wanted her body to be cremated. Or did she? Well, no, she didn't. That wasn't her, was it? No, somebody else wrote that will. But don't worry, because the lawyers, the solicitors, the family, they knew something was up. And just thanks to those and their thinking and knowing that family member that Shipman was finally caught and stopped. The solicitors, being pretty sound, contacted Kathleen's family and said, something is up with this will. We don't agree with it. We think something is wrong. And thankfully, the investigation restarted. The police found that Kathleen Grundy's medical records had been falsified and it stated on there that she was addicted to opioids. Her family were like, no way. She's not addicted to opioids. No, no, she is not addicted to opioids. So red flag, tick. 
Her body was exhumed with the permission of her family and they found lethal doses of morphine in her body. So we're looking at forensic toxicologists who are coming in now to test those toxins, poison levels in that body. And they found that there was that much dimorphine in there, it was impossible for her to survive. Shipman was arrested and a further 11 bodies were exhumed. And guess what? They all had lethal doses of morphine. There are over 250 deaths said to be attributed to Harold Shipman. 15 confirmed victims that we know of and the rest speculative but a strong belief that these people have been murdered by Harold Shipman. 250, the most prolific serial killer in the whole of Britain's history. Shipman, however, maintained his innocence throughout. He was like, I never ever commit any, any murders, no, I'm a great guy really tried to convince people he was a really good person. Didn't work, however, and he was sentenced to a whole life order. Now, a whole life order means you're never getting out of prison. You will never be eligible for parole because you are deemed too high risk to be integrated back into society. Shipman took his own life in 2004, and that is where the story ends there. So, Dr. Harold Shipman, or you got that stripped, didn't they? Harold Shipman, also known as Dr. Death. Another cool name for a very bad guy. He killed over 250 people, suspected, and his modus operandi, his MO, was to target the most vulnerable people in society and administer lethal doses of morphine. He got hold of this morphine because he was a doctor and he was falsifying prescriptions in order to administer these things. And it was quite believable because the victims he was, you know, dealing with had got medical conditions where they may need that to alleviate pain. He did also kill younger people and sometimes men as well, but mainly he targeted elderly women who resembled his mother. When we're looking at forensic psychology, you're probably looking at your power and control style killers. And that's where they get a bit of a kick out of having the control of something, being that God amongst men. So yeah, that's Dr. Harold Shipman, also known as Dr. Death. I hope you found that interesting. Please let me know what else you'd like me to cover in the comments below. If you could like and subscribe, that'd be super helpful and share to your friends who might enjoy this kind of footage. Thank you very much. Uh, look after yourselves, look after each other, and please don't commit any crimes.